Well, all right, let's, uh, let's open up our Bibles to the uh, book of Deuteronomy, and uh, we want to be in chapter 2 today. Again, a little bit of background um, by way of review, simply because it's been a number of weeks since we uh, started the book. And, and you remember that what we have in the book of Deuteronomy is essentially the final words of Moses, where Moses and, and Deuteronomy is divided up into several last addresses that Moses is giving to the children of Israel. We're going to cover about the final month of the man's life. So here is this great guy, this incredible man, incredible servant of the Lord. And so we're able to read the final words that he speaks to a group of people, of course, that he greatly loves and, and, uh, and, and cares for. Now, you remember that the setting is, is that the first generation has come out of Egypt and uh, they were parked there at the base of Mount Sinai and God gave them the law. And uh, then they uh, traveled north and they came to the border of the promised land and that was the scene of their great disappointment and their great failure. And the Lord said to them that, look, we're, uh, we're done here and uh, all of your carcasses are gonna be buried out here in the wilderness and I will then lead your children into the promised land. And so the second generation of believers were the ones that were gonna take the promised land. And so what Deuteronomy is, is the second giving of the law. The first giving of the law was to their moms and dads. And now what Deuteronomy is, is that Moses is taking them through the law. Once again, this is God's expectation of you. Walk in obedience to the Lord and God is gonna uh, bless your life and he, he's gonna bring conquest to the land and, uh, and, and all, of these, all of these things. And so essentially what Deuteronomy becomes is, look, just don't be like your loser mom and dad. All right, that's, that's what it's, it's about. And it's interesting, isn't it, how you'll see a child maybe raised in a somewhat negative environment and the, you know, may, maybe they're a little edgy. Maybe there there was a little bit of abuse going on there, and the and I've seen this in young guys where they have said, "I am never going to be like my dad. I I will I never be like my dad." And, and you know, his dad probably had some addiction issues and abuse issues and that. And it's interesting how even though the young man is set, that's not what I'm going to become. It's so interesting so often that they just end up walking in that very path that the, that they're on. Now. You you remember how chapter one ends. We're, we're, we're told in uh, verse 45 of, uh, of chapter one that then they return. Now, this is after their moms and dads had this great failure there at Kadesh. Uh, they, they returned, and, uh, and uh, it, it says there that they, they wept before the Lord, and uh, he wouldn't listen. He's not going to change his mind. Look, judgment has come. And so they stayed there at Kadesh for a long time. I, I guess so. They stayed there for decades. They stayed there until the lion's share of that first generation, uh, they, they all died off. So now we're at a time in history where you got Moses and you've got Jacob, or, or Joshua rather, and, and you've got Caleb. Now there might be a, a handful of others, we don't know, but we know that these three yet remain alive, and as soon as everybody's gone, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, that then they're gonna cross over the, uh, the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land. Now, where they are at, and, and we covered this, um, over and over again, uh, is that they're on the north shore of, uh, of the uh, Dead Sea, and they are in the plains of, of Moab, all right? And uh, now, where he's going to take us here now, he's going to explain how do they get from Kadesh over there to the plains of Moab. Now, this is all history they know. This is all very recent history, but there's a lesson that he wants them to see before they make their final step across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. So we read in verse one, that it says that then we turned and we journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, 
as the Lord spoke unto us, right? Now, and, and it says that we skirted then by Mount Seir, and we were there for many days. Now, you, you shouldn't think of it in terms of decades or years. It was probably a somewhat relatively short period of time that they are there at Mount Seir. Now, please notice that the verse begins with, with we. So he is, he's talking to his audience, and he's saying, now, we went, all right? Me and you, remember? After, after your parents blew it, and we were there at Kadesh for a very long period of time. Then the Lord said, all right, you got to move. And what happened was is that they were up there in Kadesh, which we would look at as sort of southern Israel, if you will. This was the great failure. And for the last 38 years, they've been going around and around in this general vicinity of the Mideast. Then the Lord said, all right, now head south. And you go to Mount Seir because what's happening is is that they're going to have to go around uh, what was known as the tribe of of Edom, and they they God didn't want them, as we'll see here in just a minute, to mess with them. So they're down in Mount Seir, and now the Lord is going to tell them, "All right, now it's time for you to to go back up north." Now notice in verse four that the and command the people saying uh, that you are about to pass through the territory of your brethren, very interesting, and the descendants of Esau uh, who live in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you, and therefore, he says to them, now you watch yourself. Now remember, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. So Abraham has Isaac. Isaac then, you remember, has these twin sons. They're not identical sons at all. Esau is the firstborn. Jacob is the second born. Of course, the blessing in the Messiah is going to flow through Jacob. So Esau and the descendants of Esau are their, are their cousins, if you will. So the Lord is saying, look, this is family. You play nice, all right? I don't want you to mess with them at all. And notice that he, he says to them that, that look, they're, they're afraid of you. They got a little bit of Israeli anxiety going on. I mean, what would, what would it be like? You get up tomorrow morning, you got two million people walking in your front lawn. I mean, you're gonna be, you're gonna be a little nervous about a situation like that. You don't know what their intent is. Why are you here? And, and, and so the Lord is saying, look, you're gonna freak these people out. So you just make sure, because sometimes anxious people, freaked out people, sometimes they do crazy things, all right? So you're not crazy, you're not filled with anxiety, so you got a degree of responsibility here. Let's not add insult to injury and freak them out further, so make sure that you simply leave them alone. Now notice that he says in, uh, in verse five, he says, don't meddle with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as one footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. Now, this is kind of humorous to me, because you remember Esau comes out, and this kid, probably one of the hairiest little babies ever born, very hair, hairy child, and that's what Esau means, is hairy. Now, Seir means shaggy. So the Lord is saying, I'm going to give Shaggy to Harry. It just, it just makes uh, sense to that. Now, notice that the Lord, very interesting, the Lord says, I am giving it, all right? I'm giving them Mount Seir. Now, this is a group of pagans, and we're going we're to see this a couple times in this chapter, where the Lord is working in the lives of those people that have no clue who the true God is. Now, isn't it interesting? In fact, wasn't it just last week? You remember the, uh, the, the great hue and cry across the land about Jeopardy? You know, the, the television game show apparently last week, they had a question about Bethlehem, and the television game show suggested that Bethlehem was in Israel, which, of course, it's in Palestine. And so everybody just freaked out. I can't believe Jeopardy's got this on. And people are just so upset that God would give land uh, to, to Israel. Now, look, the earth is the Lord's. It belongs to him. And God can give what belongs to him to anybody he wants, and it is none of our business what he does with that which belongs to him. Imagine you've got something, and you give it to a friend or a loved one, 
and somebody comes up and gets in your face and is giving you all the bill. Why do you give them, you know? And what's your response to me? Get away from me. What, what business is it of yours? It belonged to me. I'll give it to whoever I want. And the Lord. Now, notice, you wonder if the same people that are just screaming to high heaven about Israel having the land of Canaan given to them by God, you wonder if they would be screaming about this, that the Lord has given a portion of land uh, to, to these pagans. But that is indeed what, what has happened. Now, as you, as you continue here, the Lord is, is saying that, look, I don't want you to take advantage of these people at all, very important, that just because you belong to the Lord, just because you consider yourself to be a child of the Lord, that doesn't give you any right to take advantage of people. He says, look, use any of their water. Now, we're kind of spoiled about water here. We've got more water than we know what to do with much of the time. But in that part of the world, I mean, water, wow, is, is a very valuable commodity. And so, look, you drink any of their water, you use any of their food, you make sure that you pay for that. I don't want you to leave this place owing anybody anything. And the Lord said, because, notice, he says there, I'm taking care of you. I am taking care of you. I have taken care of you. I will take care of you. Therefore, you pay your bills. Therefore, if you owe somebody something, you may, don't think, well, if I pay them back, then I'm not gonna have, no, no. You don't take advantage of anybody. You trust God. He is gonna take uh, care of you. Then the Lord says, as you continue here, that, that I want you to, to now move northward uh, to the region of Moab. So you got to get this picture in your mind. They were up there very close to southern Israel. They have now traveled into this southerly direction to Mount Seir. And now the Lord is saying, all right, now you got to go back up north, and I want you to head into the territory of Moab. Now, the shortest way would be to take what was known at that time as the king's highway. But you remember from our study in Numbers that Moses said to the Edomites, who he's already been commanded, you, you can't mess with them, don't hurt them, don't start a fight with them. You remember that Moses said to the Edomite leadership, hey, we'd like to, like to travel through your land. Now, remember, they're freaked out. They're filled with anxiety. They have no idea what the intention of Israel is. And you remember that Israel says, no. Or, or Edom says no to Israel. No, you, you, you can't go through the land. No, we're not going to allow you to do that. And so what they end up doing is they take this wide berth to the east in what was known as the desert highway. Very inconvenient. But, you know, sometimes following the will of the Lord in our life can be a little inconvenient. And yet, with all of the inconvenience that God is at work, and God is teaching, and God is instructing, and all of these things. Now, notice that as they head now toward the, the Moabites, something fascinating, verse 9, and the Lord said unto me, now do not harass Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you their land. Same deal as the Edomites as a possession, because I have given R, apparently the land of pirates, I have given R uh, to the descendants of Lot as a possession. Now, the Emim that, that, that dwell there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim, they were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them the Amims. Now, very interesting again, as they head into the territory of the Moabites. Now, Moab, the guy by the name of Moab, who is the originator of the Moabites, you remember that he was the child of Lot. So he's Lot's offsprings. And again, who is Lot? Lot was the nephew of Israel's father, Abraham. So there is another family connection. And because of the family connection, the Lord says to Israel, don't mess with the Moabites at all. They're family. Now, we're told here, interesting, that he too gave them a possession of land. So now, you know, we're, we're in the region of Jordan, uh, north northwestern Saudi Arabia on the east side of the Dead Sea. And the Lord says, look, this territory 
is going to belong to them. I am not giving it uh, to you. Now, we're also told here that there were giants there. Now, it's interesting that the a meme, uh, it means terrors, all right? So these obviously were very, very uh, scary people. And uh, they, were, they were in the land of Moab. And, and God is saying uh, they, they, were, they were driven out. Now, notice then, as, as God is instructing them to continue on this northerly journey in, in verse 19, he then says, when you come near the people of Ammon. Now, do not harass them or meddle with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because notice once again, it was given to the descendants of Lot as a possession. So you remember that Lot, and he has these two sons in a very bizarre kind of kind of a way, if you remember right. And so he has these two sons. He names one Ammon and one is named Moab. So again, you've got two people groups here that are distant relatives. And so what happens now? They, they're moving through Moab and the Lord wants them to continue in this northerly journey. Now to their right, and again, continuing to the north, you've got Moab kind of going off into a northeasternly direction. And the Lord says, I, I don't want you to go in that direction. So you just, you stay completely away from them. Now notice that we're given a little bit of insight here, verse 20. And they also regarded, uh, all, and, and that was also regarded, that territory of Ammon was regarded as a land of giants. Giants formerly dwelt there, but the, uh, the Ammonites, notice, called them Zamzumen. And had quite, quite a name they called those guys. And, uh, and, and so, so isn't it interesting that, that the Hornites, uh, they were down there uh, with the Edomites. And so Edomites, they kind of had a giant problem. Moabites, they had the, the Amims, and they had a little bit of giant problem. And now we notice that these guys, the Ammonites, they've got a, a giant problem as well. Fascinating that the Bible does not give us any apology for suggesting that at this time, in that part of the world, there were very, very large human beings. Now, I know that there are um, some Bible scholars, well, Bible answer man, Hank Hanegraaff, a guy that we probably respect, that, that he says, now, now look, what you have to understand, you go back to Genesis chapter six, and it starts talking about the Nephilim and all that. You know, the sons of God came down and saw the daughters of men, and the results were uh, these, these giants. Look, all it's talking about is the godly line of Seth. Now, first of all, can we all agree, there's never been a godly line, all right, among human beings. We are all ungodly. Godly, are we not? But somehow there was this pristine, godly line of Seth, and those boys, they started dating these bad girls from the line of Cain, and uh, their children uh, were, were a mess. Now, you know, we, we have had, over the years, we've had believing spouses married to unbelieving spouses, and they have children, and, uh, and we got their kids running around down there in the children's wing. Well, they're not giants, all right? They're not, they're not some weird, freakish humanoids. I mean, they might have some other confused issues, maybe. Uh, but, but physically, they're, they're, they're just like any other, uh, any other child. Now, he calls them Zamzuma. Now, this is interesting. Uh, it means plotters, schemers, but it also means very loud. So apparently, they're troublemakers that you could hear coming from a very, very uh, long distance away. Now, again, the Bible does not say, you know, well, maybe they were, maybe they were. It just makes the statement. There were terrifying human beings that were very different uh, than the, the run-of-the-mill human being. This is a very interesting finger, kind of a gross-looking thing, actually. Still has soft tissue on it. And you think, well, so what? It's a gross finger. Well, fascinating thing about it, it's 14 inches long which would correspond to somebody probably being somewhere between 15 and, and 16 feet tall, right? And it, very interesting uh, that this guy, William uh, uh, Petrie, uh, father of scientific archaeology, studying uh, in, in uh, Egypt, 
uh, he made a fascinating statement. He said, a new race has been found which had not any object of manufacture like the Egyptians. Their pottery, their statuettes, their mode of burial, all unlike any other in Egypt. That we are dealing with something entirely different from any age of Egyptian civilization yet known. The race was very tall and powerful with strong features, a hooked nose, long pointed beard, brown wavy hair, and are shown by their carvings and their uh, bodily uh, remains. Now, apparently, whatever this guy was dealing with in Egypt is the same thing that we are dealing with with the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, all right? So the Lord is saying, now thus far, you've come in contact with these three people groups, you leave those three people groups alone because they are distant relatives. Now, notice that he then says in verse 24, as they continue now marching northward, he says, rise, take your journey, and cross over the river Arnon. Look, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite. King of Heshbon, now he was a big guy too, and uh, he's got a buddy that's big, we'll get that next time we're together. And you're gonna go in his land, now begin to possess it, and engage, um, and, and, uh, engage um, uh, him in battle, all right? And, and this day I will begin to put the dread and the fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish uh, because of you. Now you remember that eventually as Israel crosses over the Jordan River, and of course their first target is gonna be Jericho. Remember they send two spies and the two spies get inside the city. They have this encounter with this woman Rahab. You remember what Rahab said? Look, I know who you boys are, all right? And let me tell you something. This entire city is scared to death. We are filled with fear and dread because we have heard what you guys have done to these various people on the other side of the Jordan River, and it's fulfilling the very thing that the Lord was prophesying here to Israel that, look, you guys are gonna go up there and you're gonna kick their rear ends and the fame of these battles is gonna spread far and wide and nobody is gonna have the stomach to fight you guys or to engage you guys. So what's happening now, they cross over the river Arnon. Now they're told don't go to the northeast, all right? That's family up there, you don't wanna mess with them. Now alongside the eastern side of the Jordan River, you had the Amorites. Now you remember, remember again, going back to our study in Numbers, how that the Amorites came out aggressively. The, the, the Amorites didn't send a delegation and say, hey, what are, you, what, are you, what are you guys up to? They just immediately engaged them in conflict. And so Israel has these two major battles that went on and they defeated these two great kings, two kings that apparently nobody thought uh, could be defeated. We'll get to the second king next time we're together and we discover uh, that he was a giant uh, as, as well. Now, again, remember that what Moses is rehearsing for them, everything, this is very recent history for them. Isn't it fascinating? How that you and I just so quickly forget, don't we? I mean, isn't it amazing? God could do a wonderful thing. Maybe God did something tremendous for us last week. And, and a miracle, really. It was a miracle what God did for me last week. And now this week, ah, oh, now I got a fresh challenge. And all of a sudden, I'm freaking out. And I'm not even thinking about the great thing that God proved himself in uh, just last week. And so what, what is Moses reminding them? All right, now you remember we came by, those, came by those Edomites, right? And they had giants that they dealt with, but God gave it to them. And so it was okay for them. And then we, then we began to brush up against those Moabites, and 
Well, they had a giant problem too, didn't they? But God gave them that land, and so the giant problem was dealt with. And then, of course, we had those Ammonites we had to deal with. God said, Don't be nice to them. And you remember they had a giant problem as well, but God promised them the land, and well, they got their land, don't they? And then you remember we had these two big guys come out after us, Sihon and Og, that we'll get to next time. They came, but God, what did God do? God, God gave us victory. So God ha- is reminding them, here's these three people groups. They've had great victories uh, because God made them promises, and God is giving you great victories because God has given you promises uh, as well. And so now, as they turn westward, and they're gonna be looking down the barrel of a bunch of other giants there in the land of Canaan, uh, their hearts should be filled with great courage because they have seen God move, and their hearts were filled with great courage as long as they continued to remember that God had promised them and what God uh, was doing. Now, notice how all of this thing comes to a close in verse 37. Now, only you did not go near unto the land, as he explains further this battle in between 24 and 37 there, and he said, do you come near the land of of Ammon uh, anywhere along the river Jabbok or in the cities of the mountains or wherever the land of your God had uh, forbidden us. And uh, the Lord your God had for, forbidden us. And so, so he's, he's saying, look, you, you were obedient. That's tremendous, wonderful. God said, leave these people alone and, and you, you did what God told you to do. Now, in closing, let's, let's kind of reflect now on what the Lord has, has said to all of them. Notice that in, in verse 5, uh, 12, and 22, the Lord said, all right, now I gave Mount Seir to the Edomites, all right? Now, these, these are pagan people, all right? These are not the devout followers of Jehovah God or Yahweh, whatever name you, you want to choose there. They're pagan people, but God gave them a possession, and the possession that God gave them was, was in the possession of very horrifying uh, human beings, uh, but because God uh, gave them the promise, guess what? They went in and they took that land. Then, when we look at chapter nine or verse nine and verse through verse eleven, God God said, "All right, I have promised to give the Moabites uh, this land, and this land too. It had big, terrible human beings in it, but guess what? Yeah, God God drove them out. And then in verses nineteen through verse twenty two, we got Ammon, and again." The descendants of of Lot, they were given a possession. God said, hey, I've given them this land. This was a land that had a giant issue in it as as well and uh, a a pest problem, shall we say. And uh, and, and God uh, worked and and drove them uh, all out of there. Now, what does does this tell us? I think, first of all, it tells us three things. I think that it tells us that God is a very gracious God. Isn't it interesting how the Lord causes it to rain on the just and the unjust alike? Isn't it interesting how every human being is important to God? And if that human being will give God an opportunity, God will go to work in their life. It's, he, he's a good God, like, like we sang tonight. What a, what a great song. He is a very, very good God. He's, he's filled with grace. And, and he was working and being gracious, even in a bunch of pagans' life. Second thing that we see is that, that God's sovereign. Look, he, he raises up and he brings down kings and kingdoms, doesn't he? That he just says, all right, now it's time for you to get out. You're a loser, and I'm going to make room now uh, for these uh, people here, and they're, they're going to move on. So God is absolutely sovereign. God is moving the chess pieces about his board uh, any way uh, that he wants, and nobody is able to say to him, I, I don't think you should do that. God does what he wants. And then thirdly, God is teaching Israel about his character. And what is there about the character of, of God? That, that Look, think about this, that if God keeps his word to these unbelievers, I said I'm giving this land to them, all right? And he kept his word, even though there was major opposition, both the Edomites and Moabites and the Ammonites, but yet... He did what he promised to do. I have decided sovereignly they get this territory. I don't care what the opposition is. That's their territory. And we see three examples of that. And then you've got Israel moving into the Amorite territory, big guys, and yet 
God gives them victory. So in a very short period of time, maybe, what, a matter of weeks perhaps, they were able to see four examples of God giving land and then making sure that who he gave the land to uh, ends up possessing that. Now, if the Lord is active and faithful in the life of an unbeliever, well, how much more faithful is he going to be to the likes of us that trust him and are following him? And we need to remember that God, God is always faithful. It doesn't matter who he makes promises to. He keeps all of his promises strictly, and we can take each and every one of them to the bank. That's why the Bible says the promises of God, everything in Christ is yes and amen. And there is no doubt at all. And so we, like Israel, as we face the giants, as we face uncertainty, as we face whatever struggle there might be, we need to remember that if God promises something, God is going to keep that promise. So I think that as we go to prayer tonight, uh, that we should be praying, Lord, help us to believe and help us to realize that you, are always so faithful, so good, isn't he? He's so very good to us, man. Father, we do thank you that you are a promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God. I pray that you would just burn in our hearts the truth that if you said it, it's going to come to pass. Sooner or later, it's gonna come to pass. And Father, I, I pray for families in this church that are facing difficult health issues, money issues, relationship, kinds of issues. Lord, you're a good God, and you are at work in each and every one of our lives. And if we will just trust you, Father, your peace will keep us in every season of our life. And Lord, I thank you that we too, as Israel, as they could look back over their life, we too can look back over our life and see that there were these times of answered prayer. There were miracles that we saw and we knew that you were alive and we knew that you loved us and that you hadn't abandoned us. And so, Father, I pray that we, like Israel, will continue to remember and to rehearse in our minds your activity, your faithful activity in our lives. So, Lord, help us to be people of faith that just trust you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.